Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We are your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Hello and welcome to the I Create Daily podcast, a movement for creators serious about their work. I'm Leora. And I'm Devani. And today's guest was an atheist until her life-changing bicycling accident and near-death experience. As a scientist and corporate trainer for over two decades, Nancy aligned herself with the skepticism prevalent in so much of the scientific community. Until, until that fateful collision with destiny that changed her life forever. Now, Nancy is an author and keynote speaker and teaches the, de- teaches the development of heart-centered intuition toward living a life of inspiration and creativity with a focus on love, compassion, kindness, gratitude, and joy. On top of all of that, Nancy is a horsewoman, gardener, nature lover, and an incredible artist specializing in oil paintings ranging from horses, dogs, landscape, and native art. We look forward to learning more about Nancy's incredible story followed by her creative and spiritual life and her book titled Awakenings from the Light. So welcome, Nancy. Hi, thank you for having me on. We've been so looking forward to this. It took us a little bit to get, get to coordinate our schedules. And so we've really been looking forward to this yeah. for, uh, well over a month now. And I wonder, you know, like we have so much to get into with your story and so much about, you know, your life and what you're doing now and how you got to be doing that. Normally we start with origin stories. Like how did you get, how did your creative endeavor become your creative endeavor? <laughs> we've never, ever heard one quite like yours. <laughs> Included, you know, a life tra- changing experience like no one would ever want or choose, and yet yeah. changed your life for the better forever. Uh, before we get into that, I do wonder, like we have, there's so many wonderful interviews that people can see about you sharing that story online, and I often wonder in that circumstance, do you ever get tired of telling the same story, or does it help anchor you in a way into your purpose and your mission now relative to that? Yeah. I don't know. It's so. I mean, so far, I haven't gotten tired of sharing it, and I, I share it because, you know, with each with with each telling, I reach a different audience, and I reach other people who may not have heard it before. And, and it's for me just an opportunity to reach out and, and you know make a connection with other people. Now, at some point here, I'm going to be switching. I'm writing a new book, so at some point, I'm going to be switching over to talking more about that. But I don't think I'll ever get tired of talking about where this all started because it's really an integral part of the whole, the whole overall story. Yeah, so much so. And we're really looking forward to getting into it. I'm so glad to hear that. Before you go into that part of it, before that pivotal life moment, you were mm-hmm. working in corporate, um, doing trainings, and you were in the science in er- arena. Tell us what you were doing. And then what happened yeah yeah I had actually I'd gone to art school as a teen in my late teens and kind of I didn't really fully give it up but I was a I I consider myself a dabbler so I was a dabbler for many years I I I didn't have it in my brain that I could make a living with it uh, although it was something I always wanted to do so I just dabbled which meant that I didn't really have a strong style or passion for it So instead, what I did is I went back to school and got a degree in geology, actually went into my master's program in geology, and ended up uh, working in many scientific and engineering companies doing, I was doing, you know, research and, you know, geological research, but a lot of what I was doing was scientific writing and technical writing because I was really good at translating highly technical or scientific subjects into language that most people could understand. So that's where my gift, kind of my scientific gift came in. It wasn't that I was a researcher necessarily, but I was that in between. So I trained a lot of scientists on how to use specific software packages to help them in their research. Um, I taught a lot of engineering concepts and just a variety of software, like software development types of things as well. So it was really centered on engineering and the sciences. And I was very much 
into that analytical scientific mindset, I didn't want to think about anything other than physical reality. Now, if you're a scientist, you under, you'll know that I was leaving out a whole, whole huge area of science, which is the whole new quantum physics. Mm -hmm. Not really new anymore. It's been around at least 100 years. So I didn't even want to go there because it challenged that whole material physical um, concept mm -hmm. that I had. So I, I stayed within that phys scientific physical realm for a long time because it was comfortable. I, I didn't want to have to think about uh, anything spiritual, anything more than just what I could touch or measure with a ruler. So that's where I was when this all happened. And, and it was feeling, my life was feeling, it was, I wasn't unhappy, but I could, I could start to feel like I was not living my highest, per, from hindsight, I can say that I wasn't living my highest purpose. And I think it was starting really to erode me from the inside out. I didn't know what it was, though, at the time. I felt like I wanted to externalize it. So, oh, it means I just need to find a new job or, you know, find a new house or something like that. I wanted to make it about everybody else or everything else except, you know, this development. So that's where I was when all this happened, it's, thinking I that I wanted to, you know, change my job. Right, right. It's so interesting how life, sort of nudges us all and in your case it was a very big nudge it was that and but anytime we're off course whether we know it or not there's always these little clues yep life is just telling us like hey there's something else and you're kind of on the right track because you were in science right but life kept like giving you that feeling of like maybe there's more maybe there's another layer that, that that's gonna come forth for you yeah and it's such an important point too De Devani because so many people when they get into those places if it's if it's left unaddressed it tends to get progressively worse right the things like depression and medication and what have we were you. just talking about that this morning right where, yeah. and that happens a lot within the artistic community yeah where really it's just, you know, a call from the soul. So if we were to get a call from our soul, um, how would we answer it? And how would we know that the phone call, how would we recognize that ringtone? Right. Uh, yeah. Like, so, so anyway, carry on. We're, we're yeah. That, that's a really good point because now I, I have more of a context for that. But at the time, if you're not, if you're not versed in how, how to recognize that you're right, it can't, it can lead right into, at first, I call it a funk. You know, I'm just in a funk or a rut. And then it, it could lead into full-blown depression for people. So, you know, that's where I was. I was kind of in that rut stage. I wasn't quite in a funk yet, but I was certainly in a rut. And I didn't know what was what I needed to do to get out of it because I didn't want to look at this. You know, I wanted, I wanted it to be about everybody else. Uh, so what happened is in uh, December, of, excuse me, January of uh, 2014, I had been on I had been on a Christmas break. Was at that time living in Colorado, which uh, if you're on the eastern side of the state, Colorado in the winter is usually pretty beautiful. At least there are there are periods of really beautiful weather, and we were in this period of like 60 to 70 degree weather, sunny dry and so I thought well shoot I'm gonna go out for a bike ride <laughs> it's beautiful uh, and and I biked a lot so I was at that point I think I was biking mm, probably a hundred to 125 miles a week which was down from what I used to do I used to bike a lot but by that time I had backed off a little bit because of you know it was the winter and I couldn't get out much so I went out on this bike ride and it was just you know a normal running around town to do errands, which a lot of people do in the Boulder area, which is where I lived. Um, a lot of cyclists, a lot of people, you know, on, in alternative modes of transportation. And, and so that's how we do, you know, we did our, our errands. And so I went out on this bike ride to go to the library with my backpack full of books and, you know, the whole thing. And I, I went in and I didn't make, even make it like a half a mile from my house. Uh, I went into a brand new traffic circle, which is one of those, you know, it's a roundabout, one of those silly, I still hate them. I, I always hated them. I still hate them, especially now. But this was a brand new uh, traffic circle that was very narrow. I mean, there was nowhere to go in this thing. It was 
probably not well designed and, and in a place that really shouldn't have held one. So I went in on my bike in the bike lane and then the bike lane disappeared. So there was no more bike lane. So then I had to merge into traffic, which was fine. You know, the guy that was behind me was polite and backed off. He knew what was happening. Uh, it turns out he was a physician, which we'll get to in a minute, but that's something important to keep in mind. He was an emergency room doctor. And uh, so he was behind me quite a bit back, but I could see there was a, a woman. I didn't know it was a woman at the time, but there was a vehicle, uh, a very large SUV coming in from my right hand side. And it looked at first like that vehicle was stopping, uh, but it turned out as I came up, you know, I was biking along real cautiously where she came in to the circle instead of stopping, which is what she was supposed to do. She accelerated through it and hit me on my right hand side, broadside. At that point, it was like, you know, that you hear about time stood still. Well, time really did stand still. It felt like that second lasted a year. <laughs> and I was thinking about things like, this is it, I'm going to die. Uh, I'm not going to see my daughter grow up. Uh, I'm not going to, yeah, all these things that I'm not going to be able to do now in just that millisecond. Uh, and so she hit me. I somehow landed on the on the hood of her vehicle looking in at her through the windshield. And that's when I could tell it was a woman. She was texting. She had her cell phone up on her steering wheel. I'm not kidding. It was like this. Oh she had both gosh. thumbs going, oh looking at her cell phone screen yeah. and not at where she was driving. And I, and I think I must have done like a double take because I'm looking at this going, holy cow. Right. <laughs> And she didn't see me looking in at her on her on in her windshield, like, oh hello. So she kept driving because she was paying attention to her phone, and I I couldn't find anything to grab onto, and so I ended up sliding down the front of her vehicle, um, hit the pavement. She rolled over me. Luckily, I was in between, like her. So here's the two wheels. I was in between the tires. So luckily, I wasn't going to get rolled over. Um, at first, but it was still freaking me out. I hit the pavement, and it's, at that point, I I really did think, "Holy cow, this is it!" You know, she's going to roll right. I mean, I'm going to get run over. I'm conscious through this whole thing, which in hindsight was a blessing. At the time, was not a blessing, but but now I understand what the blessing was. So I I was conscious of hitting the pavement, and at that moment, I had this very weird thing happened and that's what I called it at the time. I understand what it is now but back then I thought woof this is weird what is this. My, I had a sense of being in two places at once mm -hmm. and there was a part of me what I call my the human level of consciousness which we all have. It's there is a basic level of consciousness that each physical body has and that's what was in my body you know stuck under the vehicle and what what that part of me noticed is that as she kind of rolled, so if my body's here, she's rolling over my body like this, I got stuck. So my, something on my chest, I don't know if, it, I still don't know if it was my clothing or my backpack, got stuck on the bottom of her transfer case. You know, there's a thing that comes down under the axle. It got stuck on there. And she, so she was dragging me underneath the vehicle and I am she totally unaware that you're like part of her little situation. She had no idea that she had wow. run over me. Yeah. She had no clue. So she's, she's still driving with me stuck underneath. And luckily for me, um, the people around saw what had happened. And so they were able to stop her. One of them actually moved his vehicle like across her path and stopped her um, but there was while all that was happening you know the the human me the part of me that was in my body was freaking out as you can imagine I was like I was screaming and whining and crying I didn't know what to do right. um, it was just at that moment hang on until everything stops but that part there was a part of me what you might call my soul or my higher self that was out that had been, kind of been like pushed outside of my body. If you've seen the movie Doctor Strange, 
Yes. When the ancient one first pushes his astral body out of his physical, that's what it felt like. All of a sudden, my, my astral self, my higher self, was outside of my physical body, looking at everything from a different perspective, watching the whole thing. Uh, it was sort of, she, that part of me, which I call an it because it really didn't have a, a gender, uh, that part of me was kind of coaching my human self, like, don't worry, it's going to be okay. You know, it's, it's hard, it's scary, but, but this is going to be fine in the end. Don't worry, don't worry too much. So there, it was very calm, centered, peaceful part of me that was just there as kind of a witness and just trying to help my human self through it. So when the, the, uh, the guy that was behind her was the one that cut her off. He drove around. I don't, I, I don't know what got into him to do this, but he, drove, he must have just acted on instinct, drove around the traffic circle the opposite way wow. and got in her way to stop her. Wow. And luckily, you know, for me, he did that because... I don't know how long she would have driven. She didn't know she had hit me. So when that all stopped, uh, of course, you know, the bystanders all came up and <clears throat> the guy that was in the vehicle behind me was an ER doctor. He came up. They, I started like wiggling out from underneath the car and she uh, in the, the driver got out and she started yelling at me. So the, yeah, she was yelling at me. <laughs> Um, awareness. Wow. That, that just, wow. Well, I think she was, she was in, in a really challenging place in her life and in a challenging place in her personal development. So that's the only thing that she could do was lash out. Right. And so she lashed out at me. Um, the, a couple of the bystanders, you know, coached her and kind of got her back in her car, but then they, they were afraid that she was going to drive off. So they, they made sure that they kept the car, the vehicle door open and they were standing there with her. Um, and then uh, as I was struggling, I really wanted to get up and run. And you hear about this happening. Like people say, well, it's this flight or fight that kicks in. And it really did. Yeah. I wanted to get up. The first thing I want to do was stand up. And I hate to say this now because I'm not a violent person, but I really wanted to, to slap her. <laughs> And, and then I wanted to run away. Those were the two things that I wanted to do. I wanted to do both, fight and, fl and flee. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Let me just interrupt for a second because um, when I've heard your story before, and I never heard you talk about the other driver to this extent before, um, and I wonder, you know, not the other driver, but the driver that ran over you, and I just thought, one of my worst nightmares about the concept of driving, as I've told my kids as well, is that if I inadvertently injured someone i would rather be the one injured in an accident than to inadvertently injure yeah. someone else i just cannot imagine that horror and that pain so i'm shocked to hear that she didn't jump out just like screaming for you rather than at you but i think again your benevolence is evident and clear relative to your journey because um, now you recognize that you know She's probably scared an like, open holy heart crap. an open heart couldn't have done uh, an open heart yeah. couldn't have done that you know and yeah. a uh, a kind person couldn't have done that so she clearly was in a troubled state yeah she was and i and and i found out later that this wasn't the first incident that there were had been many before this um so it it wasn't about me it was about where she was you know in her own journey and as, as a human being and you know, potentially a soul journey as well. Right. Um, so the, yeah, the first thing that I wanted to do was get up and run. Luckily there was, um, a woman who showed up, her name was Anne or Annie or something like that. And she put her hands kind of on my shoulders like this, you know, and, and said, my name's Anne. I'm a trauma nurse. Wow. I'm here with you. I want you to stay still, stay on the ground till the paramedics come. Uh, and if she hadn't done that, I, I don't know that I would have survived, actually, because my, I didn't know it at the time, but my neck was broken. And well, I had five vertebrae in my neck that were broken in multiple places. 
and I didn't have any ligaments or tendons left on either side of my neck. I mean, they were like totally torn. So if, if I would have gotten up, my doctor very bluntly said later, your neck would have fallen over, your head would have fallen over to the side. You would have been at least a paraplegic immediately. So she, she really saved me. Yeah, you ha it's amazing how many people around you in that moment were just there for you. The right people at yeah. the right time. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it was coincidence. <laughs> um, and especially with the doctor and the nurse, you know, the doctor being behind me at that specific moment, and he was an ER doctor who was, who was on his way to serve in the, he was going to his job in the hospital where I was going to be taken. Wow. Um, and so he was on his way to work and saw the accident happen. So he took care of me the rest of the day in the trauma center. Um, the nurse we never did find. So we're not, and he didn't know the nurse and which was unusual. So he, I spoke with him later. The district attorney's office spoke with him later. Nobody could find this nurse. And we looked well, not me personally, but the, the Boulder County DA's office looked for her all over Colorado. I mean, they were looking hard for her not to do anything bad. But basically, I said, can you find her? I want to thank her. Yeah, That's all I wanted to say. And they, could, they looked hard and far, and they could not find her. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not really sure. If she was, if she was like a physical human angel who happened to just be driving by at that particular moment and was a nurse maybe in another state and was visiting, who knows? I, I don't know. Maybe she was a spiritual being that made an appearance. Um, we're not really sure. Right. But the fact that nobody could find her is a little bit telling. Uh, the, the chaplain at the hospital didn't know her either. And the chaplain at the hospital said, well, it was probably an angelic type of being that stepped in and helped. But, you know, be that as it may, whoever it was, I'm extremely grateful. But um, so they took me to the to the ER where they did all the scan. You know, they, they had me in there almost all, all day. And it turned out I had like, I don't know, it was well over 100 bone breaks I had, I think it was 24 bones that were broken in multiple places, most of them in my neck and, and back. So I was in pretty tough shape. And for, for whatever reason, I stayed conscious through all of this. I didn't, you know, they, the doctors were shocked, you know, that I didn't die during the accident. And, but I did a couple of days later in the OR. And that's where I was brought into the OR to fix my back uh, because it was so badly broken. And uh, that's where all, you know, that's the whole culmination of all this. So I had that weird experience of being in two places at once and I had to put it aside because I didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, a few days later when I was in surgery and, and died on the operating table, that's when it was like, I, I couldn't deny any longer that there was something more than what we call this physical reality. Were you immediately able and willing to accept the things you had learned the the, the soul she hasn't done that yet part. in the story she hasn't gotten there yet in the story oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> i did you know i did i i didn't after the accident so there was the that that dual consciousness during the accident i didn't really know how to deal with that i didn't even know what it was i had no words to describe what that was because no one had ever told me about that you know it wasn't in my awareness. And so I thought, shoot, I don't know what that was. So I'm just going to put it aside. So then I had the, the actual death experience in the OR a few days later. And after I came back from that, I really was able to accept the majority of it right away. I mean, there was still, you know, it took me a while to fully bring it completely into my heart and soul. But, um, there was no way for me really at that point to deny it. It was, and we'll talk about that as, as we kind of go on. But so I was brought into the OR and given anesthesia, which I'd had before, but this time the same anesthesia caused my heart to stop. And it, it may have been a result of just all the body trauma. We're not really sure why, but my heart stopped. Of course, my breathing stopped. Uh, my blood pressure dropped to zero, 
And it, it stayed that way for, from the, what the nurses said, about 60 to 90 seconds. You know, so it wasn't that long, but it was long enough. Um, and my doctor said later, the, the length of time doesn't matter. It, it, it's just that it has to happen, and that's it. It doesn't matter how long it lasts. But so I didn't know that, though. So I wasn't conscious of the fact that my body was in distress at that time. All I noticed is that when they gave me the anesthesia, it was no longer gray. I woke up in a beautiful place that was filled with this beautiful silvery kind of energetic glowing light. And all like all around me were trees. I was in a meadow, but kind of off in the distance was this ring of trees that were like taller and more incredible than I mean, even the redwoods. And if you've seen the redwoods, those are pretty impressive. But these were even more incredible than the redwoods. I mean, they were huge. And, and they had this fiery energy going through it, which was through everything. It wasn't just the trees, but everything had this energy flowing through it. And I soon realized that that energy we, is something, the closest term that we have for it is love or maybe compassion or kindness. I call that now divine energy because that's what it felt like. But at the time, it felt like I was being not only embraced by love, like from the outside, but from the inside too. So there was, there was love coming through me, which I thought was like, what is that? <laughs> that's weird. And I, I kind of sat with that for a little while. I'm, look, I'm looking around like this, feeling this peace and almost a familiarity like, yeah, this is, this is kind of neat. I like this. Um, and then I, I thought, well, I wonder if something happened in the operating room. So I was conscious of the fact that I was being operated on. And there was a thought of, I wonder if I died on the operating table, and this is what everybody calls the afterlife. And when I then I thought to my, and I'm thinking all this internally. I'm not voicing anything out loud because there's no one with me at that point, or at least I didn't think there was. <laughs> um, so I'm 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 kind of talking to myself in my own head and looking around like, well, shoot, if I died on the operating table, what's all this? Because I don't believe in anything. <laughs> I, I don't I don't believe in anything at all. And if there is a heaven, why am I here? Because I'm an atheist and don't all atheists go to hell? You know, that's that's what I was taught as a kid. So what surprised me is that there was an answer to that. And it was an answer that was it felt so true in my heart and soul that I immediately felt comfortable. And and the message was you are a part of me. And the me is like a capital M. So it was like this me encompassed all of creation. You are a part of me. You're, and the, the best word that I can come up with is that you are a child of mine, which doesn't translate really well, but it's, it's the, closest I can, the closest I can come. But basically, you're a part of, of me. Welcome home. This is your home. This is your spiritual home. And when I heard that in here, it wasn't an audible like with my ears. It was a hearing with my heart. I wept because all of a sudden I remembered. It, everything came back to me, almost all of it, all at once. Like, now I remember. This is my home. This is my spiritual home. This is where we all belong. This is our spiritual home. No matter who you are, who you know, whatever we all we all end up in a spiritual place. And I was also, I think, deeply grateful in wor that word in a way that words can't describe that that I was accepted. I mean, for all of the little silly things that I had done as a human, you know, we all do silly things. We all do hurtful things, whether we realize it or not. Um, and that I was accepted, not necessarily accepted and loved. Not everything that I did was well liked, grant you, but or 
you know, it wasn't like I was going to get off scot-free for, for some of the nastiness that I had brought into my world, but, but at least, but I was still loved, you know, as you would love a family member uh, or a child of yours. And I was loved and accepted back. However, um, there, it wasn't necessarily like that I had to do a penance for what the things that I had done, but, but there was this immediate desire for me from within here to make things right. And there's a difference there. It was from here. I wasn't being told that you need to go back there and get your act together, right? It was a desire from within myself that all, you know, through this whole experience that we'll talk about a little bit about, I developed this huge desire to set things right, no matter how that rolled. It, it could have been from a, from the spiritual side of the house, I could have helped set things right, or it could have been coming back into my body, you know, as it was revived and, and doing things here. But I, through this whole experience, I, I knew that I wanted to set some things right and, and make amends. I mean, that's really the only thing I can, the only term I can come up with. Um, so there wasn't this huge, you know, you're a bad person for doing X, Y, Z. It was more like, oh man, I didn't realize how that came off. <laughs> yeah. I want to make that right. Um, so I was, uh, I was approached by a guide, a woman, a teacher, who helped me learn a ton of stuff, way more than we can go into in an hour. Um, but a, a, a bunch of spiritual concepts that I needed to know, and as te you know, for her it was a way to teach me what I needed to know in order to come back here and and make this life the one that I wanted to live and, and to do the things that I wanted to accomplish and agreed to do before I came here. So she helped with some of the bait, you know, a, a, a lot of people listening to this might think they're, you know, it's basic stuff, but I, I was, I didn't have the basics. So I needed to learn those basics. And, and some of them were the thing, the concepts like divine love that we just talked a little bit about. What is that? really truly what is it and how does it connect it, it connects us all together all of us are part of this well, i call it the field of divine love because that's what it is it's an energy field that permeates everything and we are all intimately connected to each other and to our environment around us through this field of divine love and everything that we do it's it's sort of like the ripples on a pond when you touch the surface of the pond you know these ripples kind of roll out well anything that you do has a ripple effect on this field of divine love and i had to learn that you know from the from a really basic level like to to see it in a spiritual way how it really rolled out around me so that when i came back here i could be more conscious in each moment of how I came into my life every moment of every day because it really truly is a moment by moment thing. You know, you're, I, I am much more conscious and aware and peaceful right now than I ever have been ever before because I'm focused on how I show up in the now moment. So if you've read Eckhart Tolle, you know what I'm talking about. And I, I always thought the guy was a total, you know, I thought he was, you know talking some weird stuff yeah. until I experienced it myself and I understand now what he's talking about it's showing up in that moment and really having not only your whole head in the moment but your heart too and, and what is it that that I can bring to this moment and make that moment better for at the very least for me but but in doing so make it better for other people um, so a lot of what I learned had to do with how we're connected and how the things that I choose to do affect other people, um, positive or negative. I mean, we all inadvertently do things. I still inadvertently do things, say things that are like, <laughs> but now I'm, I'm conscious of it when it happens. And then I 
immediately am able to step in and say, sorry, you know, I'm really sorry that's not, that did not come out the way that I wanted that to come out. So when you're more conscious in each moment, you're able to, to step in and do those things and say, I'm sorry, that really was not what I meant to say. Um, but the whole, sorry. no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, then at least when you're conscious in those different moments and settings, wherever, whatever is happening, you at least know that you can control your own side of, I guess, right. your, own, your own side of the story in terms of leaving everything in a peaceful, resolved right. manner. Exactly. Of what everybody else is doing. It's, it, it, and it's a blessing, really, to be able to do that, not only for myself, which if that's all it ever turned out to be, still would be a blessing because I was an anxiety ridden, fear ridden woman before this happened. I was anxious. I was driven by fear and insecurity my entire life. And the, the transformation that happened during, during this experience, uh, uh, this spiritual experience was incredible because it, for whatever reason, however it happened, it, it, it cut my identification with fear. So I no longer identify with fear. I no longer identify with insecurity or victimhood or any of those negative things. Uh, it, it's broken that, that chain, I guess, that used to bind me, uh, my, me spiritually. And, and it really does free you to not only improve your life moment by moment, but like you said, show up and help other people just by the way that you show up in that moment. I mean, you can totally diffuse a situation just by the energy you bring in, you know, in that moment. And I've seen it with other people. I've done it myself. I use it on airplanes now when I fly. It really works. <laughs> It's nice, but it, it but it's it's just a side benefit, really, for me of of all of that stuff that I learned, you know, during my time in the spiritual realm. Um, and it it that that spiritual experience. Some people call it a near death experience. Most of us that have had these don't like that term at all because it really wasn't a near death experience. It was an experience of death for me, but it was also a spiritual experience. So. That's how I like to talk about it. But it for me, it was an opening. It, it was a heart opening. It was bringing, basically bringing my soul really to the forefront of my life eventually. And that took a little work. But what, what that also unleashed was, you know, as we were, we'll talk about, is an incredible creativity, the likes of which I have never seen in my life for me. Um, I could not. As soon as I woke up from the, you know, the experience in the recovery room, you know, I, I wanted, first of all, I wanted to go back there because it's hard to be cut off from, oh, yeah. it, it's an incredible experience to be that connected intimately with the spiritual realm. You can't describe it. it it's incredible. But I also wanted to create immediately. It was like something lit off <laughs> in me to be a creator. I mean, I had known how to paint before. I could technically paint, but my doctor had to hold me back. You know, he said, you can't paint yet. Your neck isn't healed enough to be able, because I, I oil paint, I stand up when I paint. So that the pressure on my neck would have been too much. And, and it was like, come on, you gotta let me, <laughs> you gotta let me at the easel. I need to paint. Uh, so what he let me do instead was write. So I, could write. I had a, you know, a bunch of these, like, everybody sees these black notebooks. Well, my friends got me some black notebooks and I just started writing what had happened to me. Nice. And I filled, I think, two of those thick notebooks of just, here's what happened next. And this is what I felt. And this is what I experienced. And this is what I learned. So until I could paint, I was allowed, you know, to write. And so I wrote about what happened. And then as soon as he let me paint, I'm like, let me at the canvas. <laughs> and it was no holds barred. It was crazy. I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I really don't. But there was certainly an opening 
to that creative source that happened during all of this that still hasn't turned off. Um, and it's been five years of like this intense, almost exhausting at times, uh, desire to create yeah. fun yeah. Uh, and certainly helped me heal in a lot of different ways, uh, but, but incredible. So yeah. very incredible. You, you mentioned in some of the other interviews that I've seen that part of the conversation you had in that realm what had to do with how you um, needed to get on with your promise, what, you know, why you were here and what you had promised to do. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So initially, uh, I really didn't want to come back here. <laughs> when, when I, when my, when my spiritual teacher came to me, she, you know, she explained that she was here to teach me things so that I could go back to my life you know, and, and live it the way that I was supposed to live it and do the things that I was supposed to do. And I said, no, I really don't want to go back there. Um, and what she explained to me was, well, you've already agreed that you were going to go back. And I turned and looked at her and I'm like, I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't remember signing up for that. So she, uh, it's kind of weird how they do this, but kind of in the air in front of me, it sort of became like a movie screen and she showed me almost a, almost like a video, but for her, it was a memory. So it was from her perspective, a memory of me with a lot of my other spiritual friends and spiritual teachers agreeing to do some specific things. Now we don't, there, there are maybe a few people that come into this life with a very specific agenda from start to finish most of us come in with some high points that we'd like to accomplish or do or whatever. And that's how it was with me. So uh, there were some highlights and some uh, potential crossroads that I had in my life. So what I was, what she showed me that I was agreeing to was there were going to be two crossroads in my younger life where I could make a switch to a spiritual lifestyle, a more spiritual way of being, um, more heart-centered. And if I didn't, if I chose not to, to take a, you know, that spiritual road at either one of those two points, then at this third point, I would have this experience. So I'd be hit by this vehicle, I'd have this spiritual experience, and then come back and be a teacher for other people also for myself though. Um, so that's what she showed me was me agreeing to these three specific points and that on point three, if I still hadn't figured it out, basically, then I would have this big, you know, big event happen where I could no longer deny that there was a spiritual reality. Now, the whole part of me being an atheist was also very important in, in hindsight for where I am now. So I think that as I was going through my life, my soul kind of said, you know what, I think we're, I think we're going to need to be an atheist for a while longer and, and, and learn what we need to learn. And it turns out that that experience of being a non-believer, as a doubting Thomas, as my mother calls me, um, allowed me to really identify with a lot of other people who are in the same boat. You know, there are a lot of scientists out there. I mean, I'm, I'm saying a lot of scientists out there who or analysts or engineers who are like I was, uh, and a lot of people just in general who are, they have a very analytical mindset or a very logical mindset and are, or are very physically oriented they're kind of toying with this like spiritual thing. Where is it? What is it? Is it real? So now I have, because I'd been that way for so long, I have an understanding of what that feels like and an empathy for where they are um, and can more easily speak to them. That and, makes so much sense. Yeah. And as you were talking about your earlier life, earlier in, the, in this, interview um you mentioned that part of your job as a researcher was to take 
difficult concepts and disseminate them into mm. simpler layman's terms almost. Synthesize. Synthesize is the good term. And so it sounds like that also served because part of what you're, that's exactly what you're doing now. You're a conduit or a bridge between the yeah. inner world and outer worlds, bringing those concepts and then conveying them, translating them down, you know, to the physical plane understanding. Yeah. In fact, that's what uh, about 18 months ago, one of my, I still, I still have uh, a connection with some of my spiritual teachers and one of them said it is, you know, you're, you are here, here now in this physical life to be that bridge, just as you described. And, and that, that's kind of where things are changing for me. I'm no longer really focusing on the spiritual experience itself. My, my bridge now is, is kind of a multi, it's a, it's a multi-pronged bridge. So not only is it between spiritual and just plain physical, but I'm also bridging my, my intent is to bridge the science gap in the spiritual gap for those people on either side who are kind of toying with it. So there are a lot of, of spiritual people who, who don't, who aren't scientists and who want to learn more about how, what, what is all that quantum physics stuff anyway, and how does it relate to what we believe? And then there are a lot of scientists and engineers who are like, so, I kind of am starting to hear this quantum physics stuff. What's all that? What are all those spiritual people talking about? And I think at some point, maybe not in my lifetime, but at some point there's going to be this mesh. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the things that I'm supposed to do is really to help start build those, you know, connections amongst these different groups uh, in whatever way, you know, I can. Um, and I think there's a gift here with the creativity too, because like I told you earlier, I can't, I can't turn it off. So obviously it's important, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and it's, it is so important. And there's just so many connections that we'll even like you alluded to earlier, more than we will have time to get into. But once you get into the creative realm, you know, you don't, you, the flow picks up speed. You know, it yeah. doesn't stop. There's no faucet turning it off. Once you tap into that, you know, it just continues to flow. And it seems like that's part of where you went. You know, you visited, you know, that yeah. realm of beauty and creativity, love, yeah. joy, and kindness, you know, and, yeah. and you don't turn that off. No. You know? And what I find really fascinating every time we interview anybody, and it's very apparent in your story as well, is just the ways that when you look back, all the dots just connect. They just, they're there. They're so apparent looking back. We don't ever see it really living our day-to-day -day lives. Right. But the dots connect and you are a scientist, you are an atheist. You needed to develop that side yeah. of you so that you could become the conduit of all these ideas and notions to just, that, that do shock people, you know, that aren't used to thinking like that. But then yeah. also the creativity and like, you were rooted in science, which is a lot about curiosity hmm. and then it is when you had this experience and this creativity awakened in you and creativity is also really rooted in curiosity and so now yeah. it's like your whole life is like so much richer and more complete because you can play in both arenas and they're both like rooted in this curiosity and you can just synthesize it together and help other people understand all of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, it's a blessing, even though there are times when I do have to like physically like put the brush down and go walk away and go take a nap because it, it, it's like, it is, it's like drinking from a fire hose really all the time. And I'm, I, the, the reason I, I always have this thing in my head, like, yeah, I think I'm just going to stop painting you know, it, it, yeah, forever. And then about the next day it comes back. But I think for me, if I don't continue to create in some way, so when I'm, there are times when I actually do have to take a couple of days off from painting because it's like I'm on visual overload with, you know, two dimensional uh, creativity. So then I, everybody laughs when I tell them this, then I go make jewelry <laughs> because I love, I, I'm, I don't really have much on now, but I love jewelry and it's a, it's a three dimensional uh, process for me, but it's also because the way I create it is very intentional. I use um, gemstones and certain metals to get a specific spiritual feeling or vibration in, in each piece. 
uh, it, 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 it uses a different aspect of my creativity or divine creativity that comes through in a different way. So there isn't really a day goes by that I don't create something. It may just shift a little bit from day to day. And of course, I'm still attempting to write. And, and that is, you know, I spend a couple hours a day on that typically, uh, usually first thing in the morning. Because after, for me, I burn out on writing after about two hours and then I have to put it away. And that's and that's when I go to the easel. Um, so I'm exceedingly grateful that I I can go from one thing to the next and still allow different aspects of of that creative source to come through. It, it's just it's a blessing. Definitely. So speaking of which, how has your life changed in terms of your career? In terms of how you earn a living? Are you able to do that with the art that you're creating, or are you back in? some other science related career what are you doing now yeah you know it's it's um it's evolving so there at first i i did go back into full time art for i don't know a couple of years after this happened and i have a fairly high need for security <laughs> so i took on a, a part time uh science writing job again it's medical uh medical stuff so that I have that that steadiness of the income, um, and I do get, and I certainly do get income from my books as well. So, there, my right right now, my income is really divided up from three different sources, which personally for me feels a lot better. So I don't have all my eggs in one basket, which then allows me uh, to kind of devote more mental and and heart space to creating what I want rather than. Uh, worrying about what's going to sell and the long-term plan for me is to really be able to ditch um, the the technical writing or the scientific writing because uh, it's losing its luster for me and we're right now my I've got some help kind of with a business counts uh, counselor helping me figure out how to transition that into like a hundred percent creative endeavors that will bring in um you know the income that i'd like so it, it's a it's divided up about you know 30 percent 30 percent whatever else is left it's like you know 40 uh, percent technical writing so it works out pretty well and it, it just makes me comfortable since i'm single i don't have a husband or a spouse to rely on for an income it's all me and, you know, with the daughter going off to college, I need to make sure there's some base level of, of income coming in. And for a while, you know, I beat myself up about that, about having to have that little secure income. You know, we do. We like to beat ourselves up about stuff like that. And then I thought, you know what? No judgment. That's what, I, that's what makes me feel comfortable and allows me to create what I need to create. So yeah, it's okay frees up so much mental bandwidth like worry takes up an incredible amount of energy yeah and yeah so the, the more we can just decrease all of that because right creative people naturally i think tend to worry a lot if when they're not in that fulfilled space of creativity it can very easily turn into the negative worry about everything and so yeah security nuts are great <laughs> Yeah, again, it's the breaking the hold of fear. You know, if you, if you can do something, even small, to break the hold that fear has over you, and worry is a fear. Yeah. Um, that's what it's about. If it means, you know, I have a friend who kind of did the same thing. as She had actually had a stroke and had some challenges and decided to become a full-time artist. She was an engineer as well. And, um, again, about two years in, she's like, yeah, I'm not – I think I need a little bit more cushion here. So, you know, she was in the same, we were in the same space at the same, same time. And we just both decided it's okay to rely on, you know, this part-time income that feels, you know, secure. And then that, and that's fine. You know, whatever gives you the freedom in, in here to be able to create from your heart. Yeah, absolutely. This, this next comment jumps back to the previous thing, one of the previous things you were talking about that I forgot to mention at the time. Just another connection when you were talking about the challenge that many engineer types, science mind types have with reconciling this, the, the concept of a spiritual life. And I, in my past, have connected with 
many scientist types who actually were drawn to Buddhism because mm -hmm. it helped them tap into spirituality through meditation without it having to connect them to an outer deity or some other, you know, higher intelligence in that regard. Have you seen that as well? Yeah, here in the U.S., that's kind of uh, unusual. I mean, we're unusual in that way in that we have what's called secular Buddhism. I believe it's kind of a prevalent in Europe, too. But it's not really how Buddhism evolved. Um, but somehow we've, we've come up with this secular Buddhism that really does work well for a lot of, of analytical or scientific people. And that's kind of where I was. I mean, I used to meditate a lot before all this happened. And it helped a little bit with my anxiety, but not. it didn't address, because it was secular, you know, because it didn't go into the spiritual, it didn't address those deep-seated needs that I had for that spiritual um, connection or that, that spiritual insight, but it does help, you know, and, and it's, I think for some, uh, I've heard that it's a good bridge into something even more spiritual. Un it's unfortunate though, that at least in the United States right now, that scientists have to be closet spiritual people. And they really do in order to continue to, to, have the career in the sciences that they're used to. Uh, and and I, I've had a lot of people, I mean, there are people at big name institutions who are top science, like, you know, the Indiana Jones top scientists. Well, the, the top scientists, and I've had several top scientists in the U.S. contact me and say, you can't tell anybody this, but I follow you and I totally agree with what's happening and what you're saying and I'm a spiritual person too, but no one can know. Yeah. We can't let anybody know. They feel like they would be um, attacked, and, and they probably would be, and it's a shame. It is. We want to get to your art and your next book as well, but first let me just mention, have you heard of Mark Gober? I have not, no. So you'll want to know about him, and we'll include links to his interview in the show notes of yours. He wrote a book, an upside, sorry, an end to upside down thinking, dispelling the myth that the brain produces consciousness ah, yeah. implications for everyday life. And he features a number of near death experience stories in there. So I'm sure he would also be interested in connecting with you. But he came from an investment world and a finance world, totally disconnected from spirituality, and he began investigating it because there were things he couldn't ignore. Right. And he's doing a really great job of beginning to link the two worlds, mm -hmm. um, just like you are. So I think you guys would have a lot in common to connect with. Great. Thanks for that. Yeah. And so um, what I was wondering is, back to your art for a second, and you're, you are selling art. Um, you know, like, So what are your primary uh, venues for monetizing your art, your paintings, um, your jewelry? So sales outlets, right now I've got two galleries, one on the East Coast in New York, um, and she special, her name is Juliet Harrison, and she runs a, a gallery called Equus Art Gallery, which of course specializes in horses, and that's where uh, it's the majority of my work that she has is, is obviously horse work. But then I've got a gallery in Breckenridge, Colorado, who they have a kind of a selection of, of different work of mine, and... They sell, it's very seasonal there. So while on the East Coast, it's kind of steady throughout the year uh, in Breckenridge because it's a ski town, it tends, my work tends to sell best in the winter time there because that's when everybody comes in. So those are the two traditional venues. I mean, I also, you know, post stuff on Facebook and Instagram and, and all that. Uh, I've had some sales, you know, through those social media channels more than I actually would have expected. I've tried some of those online galleries, and for me, that didn't work so well. I think because my work is so so physically large that people don't people look at the price tag and they're like, "I really only wanted to pay fifty bucks, you know <laughs> so some of those online galleries tend to, to sell just really low uh, low priced work, and that doesn't fit with with my plan for my originals. However, I'm starting now to sell uh, prints, and I'm going to different like sporting goods shows and, for my wildlife art, and now horse shows or horsing, horse type events for my horse related prints. And that's brand new. I don't know quite yet how well that's going. In fact, my first big 
course event is in April, so a little bit over a month. I'll be going to the Midwestern Horse Expo in Madison, Wisconsin to sell prints of all my horse work. So if anybody's in the Midwest, look for me there. Um, but that's, we'll see how that goes. I, I, the reason I'm doing the, the in-person events more, A, I like talking to people. You know, as, when, you're, when you're an artist, it's, for, it's often lonely. So I, I like getting out there and like making connections with people. Um, but it, it, it gets me to a different audience too, which is, is also good. You know, it, I've always relied on the traditional gallery but that's a very limited audience, and and I wanted to expand the reach of my work into basically any level of any home. You know, I want people to be able to afford it, whether they can afford, you know, five thousand dollars for a huge original, or they want to pay seventy five dollars for a print. You know, I want them to be able to afford that. Definitely, we're. Um running up on the hour and we still have other questions we'd like to ask you do you have a little extra time sure okay okay yeah so one of the one things i wondered about with your paintings they're exquisite they're so full of depth and richness and yet what i wondered is from your experience in the inner world so the other side whatever you prefer to call it their colors are incredibly yeah. deeper and richer, more like jewel tones, but in manifestation than anything that we can pretty much see or, or even achieve with a lot of paints on. The yeah. Paint. Have you had any struggle with like transmitting what you see and feel <laughs> onto canvas with the, what you have to work with? Yeah, actually, that's one of the main reasons why I, st well, there are two reasons why I don't paint exactly what I saw. When I was there, people are always asking me, you know, you're going to paint what you saw. But there are two reasons for that. Number one, physical oil paint cannot do it justice. I mean, it really can't. I've been, I've tried, trust me, the last five years I have tried. And I am so far have been frustrated. I feel frustrated in my attempts at being able to recreate what I saw. Now, I will say that I believe, um, someone who is well versed like in computer graphics you know like uh industrial light and magic or something they'd be able to do it justice i don't have those skills so that's where i'm struggling with paint because like you said paint is you know oil paint's goopy it it's it doesn't have the internal energy that i experienced it's when you're when you're not limited by these physical eyes, you can experience colors on either side of our rainbow that go way out. So you, it's almost like, um, you know, I used to do a lot of satellite work with satellite data for the ge you know the geosciences, and satellites can detect electrical signals and and uh, light in different wavelengths that we can't see so a satellite can look at a p patch of ground and while you may only be able to see you know like this much in the you know the visible wavelengths the satellite can picture you know like this much mm -hmm. so it's that's similar to what I'm talking about and and that's the struggle is how do I paint a color that's beyond blue? Yeah. 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 Or below red. I, I don't know how to to effectively do that. I don't still don't know how to create that scintillating energy. I'm getting closer with some of the more monochromatic stuff that I'm doing. So there was one piece that I did recently of two horses that's a mon it's basically a monochromatic uh, painting of two Andalusian horses kind of running toward the viewer and I I think I was I'm getting closer to being able to capture some of that but what I'm using is different layers of like different colors of paint it looks monochromatic when you're looking at it but it really isn't and I'm using mineral paints which I hadn't used before uh, you know basically ground up semi-precious gemstones is what they are and that adds some life to it as well which I hadn't had with like the chemically based paints that most of us have been using so going back it's interesting going back to that more natural pigment 
seems to help with, for me anyway, um, kind of putting some of that energy back into the painting. So your book that is already out and available is titled Awakenings from the Light, 12 Life Lessons from a Near-Death Experience. Yep. And you're working on another one. I am. Do you have a title? I don't. <laughs> No title yet, right? Yeah, it, there's no title. What it, the theme of it really is, it's, of course, when I first started, I wanted it to be everything for everybody, but I've narrowed it down into the, the it's going to end up being two books, I believe. So the first, the first book will be, how did, how did, when I came back into this life, there were things that I did in order to really bring that spiritual knowledge into my working life. What was that? Because that, those are the things that when people meet me in person, that's what they ask about first is how did you get to be the way that you are? How did you get to be so calm? How, how did you get to be so present in the moment? What, how did you bring that spiritual knowledge into your life in practice. So that's the first book that it's going to be very narrow and focused in on, on that. And, and sort of a working title is something about, I don't know, easy steps to spirituality or something like that. I don't, I don't know, but that's kind of the theme is it really wasn't complicated, but it was consistent. And that's what I was told repeatedly is, your spiritual practice is important on a daily basis, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Right. You don't have to like stand on your head. You can if you want to, but you don't have to stand on your head and, you know, meditate for four hours a day and do this and that. You can if you want to, but it doesn't, you don't have to. Right. And that's what it's about is really what are some simple things that people can do consistently to bring more bring themselves really more into a spiritual focus. So that's book number one. Book number two is going to be focused on more of the things that I learned that, that again, more, more science related. So it's, it's the first book that I think will bridge that science spirituality gap. So as I'm thinking more about how quantum physics or modern thinking of physics, it's not just quantum physics, it's kind of beyond quantum physics. How, how does that relate to spirituality and the things that I've learned and how I've began to think about that in the last few years? Um, and and that evo that's evolving over time, which is why that will be the second book. I think it's really more important for me to get, to get a book out there that says, this is how I got to be the way that I am. This is what you can do and, and learn from what I experienced. Um, and it doesn't have to be complicated. Is the painting behind you over your left shoulder, I think it is, um, is, that's one of your paintings, right? Yep. Is that one of your guides? It is, and that is um, Bettina. Um, sometimes she calls herself Belinda, so I don't really know uh, what her real name is, but she's a, you know, a spiritual teacher. She is, is the, um, for me, the, the female embodiment of forgiveness. So she came... Sometimes they, you know, to make things easier for me and many other humans as well, these spiritual teachers will come sometimes wearing the cloak of a male or a female or sometimes neither. It just depends on where you are in your development and what you need. So sometimes she, she comes into my life in a more feminine form and sometimes in a, in a more masculine form just to, depends on you know what it is that i need to to hear at the at that time um and i don't i don't i i don't know where i put the other one i've got another one that i often have up behind me but she's not here right now so <laughs> it's beautiful. it is beautiful Belinda. well yeah the the reason i you know the reason i wanted to paint that one is because i don't see one of the things that i i haven't really appreciated very much in the spiritual art community, especially uh, Christian spiritual art, is that everybody's white. And I don't like that because in the spiritual realm, there is no, there is no race. There's no color of skin. This is, this is unimportant. Mm -hmm. 
and and so when I paint um, it is always my intention to represent these beings in different forms with a, a rainbow of colors because it doesn't matter it really doesn't and it's it's I guess my little bit of rebellion against the traditional Christian spiritual community art community um, when you see in a picture of an angel 99.9% .9 of the time it's a white person I personally have a, an entire mix of ethnicities in my background I mean I'm North African I'm Jewish which I didn't know um, I'm East Indian which I didn't know I'm Polynesian which I didn't know and South American which I didn't know so why should we limit right. what we paint to one skin tone it just doesn't make any sense everybody's beautiful Absolutely. everybody's beautiful yes very much so so before we let you go finally um, are there things that you know, like your guides and that like how are you do you consciously access your guides at will do they come to you just like spontaneously when you're not expecting it do you access them through meditation consciously um, like what is that continuity like for you and I guess of the questions that people have when they meet you including your own about how you're incorporating that guidance and your purpose into what you do daily um, what can you share um, to kind of bring closure to integrating it all for you? sure yeah so I um, I'm very conscious about connecting with my guides because I don't like to be just wide open. It's it's not a comfortable feeling. It's also not a very good thing to be wide open all the time. Uh, and so I consciously connect. I don't necessarily meditate. I do sometimes meditate and access it. But I uh, it's easy for me now. I just like that get into a very quiet mind state. Um, and it, it only for me takes a few moments to get there but things have to be like physically quiet around me to be able to do it for me it's it's a little bit more challenging to access that guidance when there's just a lot of chatter and noise so i tend to do it when i'm home alone my daughter when my daughter's not here um just because having a teenager in the house is you know it's it can be loud and that's fine that's just the way it is but so I, I access it very consciously. Sometimes I, you know, I pray and ask for guidance and then I'll get it. But typically it's, it's more of a just allowing myself to become really centered or, or even meditating. Um, for me, I like to do a meditation technique that it's called different things. So Christians don't call it meditation, although that it is. Uh, in Christianity, it's called centering prayer in uh, the, but but it was actually invented in India at least 3500 BC and it's a form of, it's it's mantra it's you know repeating a mantra to yourself and that for me works better than anything else in getting me centered and I sometimes say it out loud sometimes all I need to do is an internal mantra but but the mantra type meditations work the best for me and it doesn't take long for me to go into that state so what I, and for, for everybody, you know, watching or listening, um, one of the most important things in my view that you can do to begin to get into a more aware state is to have a morning routine. And not, not I'm going to get up and brush my teeth type of morning routine. It's, I'm going to take three minutes out of my day and just take some deep breaths and, and say a mantra to myself. And maybe that mantra is kindness or compassion. Or maybe I envision what I want to experience that day or what I want to bring into that day. So you can go through your intentions that day. Uh, or spend just a few minutes in absolute utter gratitude that, guess what? I got up today and now I have the opportunity to go off and maybe it's go to work or take care of my kids or whatever it is. Um, but it's exceedingly important in my view to start off your day with even just a few minutes of something very spiritual but very intentional and and you can design whatever feels good you know you don't have to do what I do but just start off your day that way and I guarantee you know it's gonna help make your day better 
especially on those days when you get up, get up on the wrong side of the bed, you know, like we all have those days. Yeah. So, I love so, how accessible the just couple minutes of it is for anybody. Like anybody can take, like, I know Tony Robbins says a lot, like if you don't have 10 minutes for yourself, then you don't really have a life because it's really in those small minutes that you can grab or you intend right. to take where the shifts happen. Yeah, exactly. And I think what people don't realize, he's right. If you start, if, if, if all you think you have is three minutes, start with three minutes. And I guarantee you're going to like those three minutes so much that you're going to want to make it five and then 10. And then you'll realize, well, if I spend 10 or 15 minutes doing this in every morning, I can bring so much more to everybody else that then my life is better. So it, I, a lot of people need to inch up on it. You know, 10 minutes sounds huge. That's why I say, just take three. Just give yeah. me three. <laughs> yeah. That, that's how we approach it, helping a lot of people through, like, creative blocks. It's like, we'll just start with, like, five, three minutes where you can get them. Because inevitably, you get into that flow. And we're sure that you'll probably end up exceeding those five minutes eventually. Yeah. <laughs> like, you just tell somebody, you just need to write something down for 30 minutes. That's it. Let's start go. there. Yeah. Start there. It yeah, the it sets the rhythm, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, which really is is a lot of it is about setting the ry rhythm, um, and allow opening the space, opening the space in your life to you have that. Yeah, creating the bridge, creating the bridge. That's right. From yep. the outer. Yeah. So that's a good tagline for you. Creating the bridge from inner to the inner to the outer worlds. Um, we hope you'll come back for when you when you have your next first book out. <laughs> so we can spend all day with you before we do finally let you go and thank you for letting us keep you over sorry about that um is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience just you know what just keep creating and and that that can be so many different things you know each moment is an opportunity to create yes and it, it isn't just necessarily painting or drawing or or creating a piece of music it's just creating the moment. And, yeah. and so you, we each have so much power to create in each moment. So run with it. Have That's fun. Cool. That's a wonderful quote. Yes, create the life you want to live. That's one right. Time, one moment at a time. Yep. Well, Nancy Rhines, thank you so much for sharing this time and space. And your story, your love, compassion, um, and your pain transmuted essentially with the world. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.